Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Institute for Government, particularly those of you who haven't been here before. Uh, I'm Jill Rutter. I lead our work at the Institute on better policy making. And we're absolutely delighted to have so many of you. And actually, I think you must rate us not only our most enthusiastic, but also our promptest audience <laughs> ever, because the usual <laughs> worry at two minutes to six that nobody is going to show up. Didn't need to worry about this this time. Um, we're going to get kicked off um, very soon. I'll introduce the panel. But just before that, this is the first, as many of you have seen, of a series of events that the Institute for Government is doing in association with the Science Policy <coughs> Research Unit, um, with the Centre for Science and Policy at Cambridge, at Cambridge with the... Uh, Nesta's Alliance for Useful Evidence and with ScienceWise. And just to tell you a very, very quick thing about the thinking behind the series and what it, where it's going to end up, James Wilson from the Science Policy Research Unit is going to just explain a bit of context and then we'll get going. So, James. Great. Thank you, Jill. Um, and just to add a thanks uh, and welcome from all the other partners. Um, I won't say very much other than to quickly run you through the plan for the rest of the seminar series uh, beyond today. Um, we have uh, a second seminar taking place um, on the 8th of January, um, hosted by the Alliance for Useful Evidence at Nesta, uh, and that's going to be looking at broadening the evidence base uh, and particularly the role of uh, science and social science, the balance between them in, in social policy. Uh, speakers of that include Paul Wiles, Jeff Mulgan from Nesta, uh, and Chris Wormel, the, the Permanent Secretary at uh, Education. Um, on the 15th of January, we're moving on to look at um, experts, publics, and open policy uh, at a science-wise hosted event at the House of Lords with John Krebs, uh, among others. Um, and then in February, on the 6th and 7th of February, we have a, a, a longer 24-hour event down at Sussex um, with speakers including um, the chief scientist uh, at the European Commission, Anne Glover, um, Bob Watson, until recently chief scientist at DEFRA, Roger Pilkey, a, a leading uh, science policy academic, uh, and various others. So that's uh, a, another opportunity, particularly to look at the international dimensions of science advice. Um, and all of this is timed, uh, as you've probably realised, uh, to coincide with the transition here in the UK system from uh, Sir John Beddington uh, as our government chief scientist to Sir Mark Wolpert. Um, that transition occurs in April next year. Um, and the culmination of this whole series will be a, a, uh, an event on the 18th of April uh, at which Mark Wolpert will speak uh, and at which we'll be publishing a uh, report that draws together uh, many of the main uh, ideas and themes from all of these events. So uh, we hope to see uh, some of you, if not all of you, uh, at some of those events over the next few months. Thanks. Okay, so this is the first event uh, in the series. So you haven't missed anything so far and hopefully it will prove a very good taster for events to come. And this one we're particularly looking at the sort of clash between science and policy, if there a clash there be, she said. Um, <laughs> Mark has put forward a hypothesis in his book, The Geek Manifesto, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Uh, quick ad, and I will collect my payment from Mark <laughs> later. Uh, egregious piece of advertising in which he <laughs> hypothesizes that policy would be made better in this country if uh, both geeks uh, were more involved and if it was better embedded in the process. So we're going to kick off with Mark. Mark is speaking both as now Director of Communication of the Wellcome Trust, but also former science editor of the Times and a history graduate, so he <laughs> has lots of credibility in bridging that. But they're going to be followed by Chi and Wara. Chi is, was elected uh, to Parliament in 2010, but comes with a really quite unusual background because she is an electrical engineer, and I think one of Mark's theses is actually there aren't very many electrical engineers <laughs> in Parliament, uh, and is also a uh, science spokesman in the Labour front bench team now. So she's going to talk about that from the perspective of parliamentarian um, and a policymaker in opposition. We're then going to move swiftly to my left, metaphorically, of course, <laughs> to... <laughs> to English graduate <laughs> Katrina Williams, <laughs> uh, <laughs> who I rang up and said, I'm going to invite you to speak on this panel, but only on the basis that my assumption is right that you didn't do science at university. <laughs> um, Katrina is Director of Strategy, Evidence and Consumers, which is a slightly odd lumping in the new management structure of the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. And actually, in the Geek Manifesto, DEFRA comes top as a department that takes science really seriously and has better embedded its chief scientist than most <laughs> other departments. And then finally, last but not least, uh, we have someone who, according to the Geek Manifesto, has more of a struggle to make his voice heard, but we have uh, Professor Rod Smith, 
who is Chief Scientist at the Department for Transport and who is, again, another engineer. Uh, and his work particularly focuses on, according to his biography, on areas of fatigue and structural integrity. And he's done work including uh, technical advice on Hillsborough Football Stadium disaster, uh, looked at volcanic ash, which is a huge big issue for the Department for Transport and actually has quite a lot of mentions in this, particularly about the failure of horizon scanning on volcanic ash, um, and is now embedding a more scientific approach in the Department for Transport. So he will finish up. So they're going to all speak for um, nine, ten minutes or so. Uh, then we're going to start open for debate, questions, etc., etc., etc. Just a warning to all you civil servants there. Uh, this is on the record. <laughs> um, we could have done it under Chatham House rules, but I think as our former permanent secretary probably now realises that if you don't know everything in the audience, you're probably not wise to think that uh, what you say may stay secret. <laughs> so that's a caution to all of you, but I'm sure we're going to have a very good and productive discussion on this. So over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Jill. And um, uh, I should start with a couple of caveats. First of all, the... Uh, uh, <coughs> the things that, uh, that Jill was quoting about DEFRA and, uh, and the Department for Transport, I'm going to blame firmly on the Campaign for Science and Engineering, which <laughs> is where that, uh, those particular uh, stats of the uh, relative embeddedness of the chief scientist in the department come from. It's a very good report uh, and well worth uh, looking up and reading. Uh, the other thing... The other thing, of course, to mention is that um, although I do now work for the Wellcome Trust, the Geek Manifesto is not the Wellcome Trust's manifesto, and uh, it's certainly not Sir Mark Walpert's manifesto <laughs> either. <laughs> uh, he may agree with some of it, but there will be many other parts that, uh, that, that he won't. So I should just make it clear that this is me uh, personally rather than the Trust uh, speaking here. So um, Jill asked me just to uh, talk a bit about... Um, my thesis really about how science could, I think, play a, a, a better uh, and stronger role uh, within policy making and, and, and lead to its improvement. And I think you have to start with um, the, the position of, of um, the scientific backgrounds uh, of uh, both MPs and, and, and civil servants. Uh, there are, as you know, 650 MPs. Uh, there are 158 who have a background in business. Uh, there are 90 what you might call professional politicians, uh, 86 lawyers, 38 from the media, and as I'm sure many of you know, only one uh, PhD level uh, scientist who's actually worked uh, in research. That's Julian Huppert. There are a few more engineers, such as Chi, uh, a couple of medical doctors, uh, and a few more science graduates. But whichever way you slice it, uh, scientists, engineers uh, make up a very, very small uh, proportion of our legislators. Uh, and the same is also true within the civil service, if not quite uh, to that extreme degree. And I'm not saying for a second that one has to be uh, a trained scientist in order to understand uh, the scientific process, the importance of evidence, etc., etc. As Jill said, I'm a historian. Uh, there are uh, many, many... Uh, politicians and civil servants who've been excellent users and champions of science who are not from that background. But even once you start to sort of throw the net out more widely for politicians uh, with uh, a strong record of uh, productive engagement with science, it's very difficult uh, to get beyond about 70 or 80 who really have any uh, engagement in, with science on their CV at all. Now, um, why, do, why do I think this matters? Well, um, I think it matters for two uh, broad uh, reasons. One is that I think without much experience of what it means to do science and without much contact with scientists, with people who work in scientific professions, um, politics and, and, and public policy often manages science poorly uh, when it's called upon uh, to do so, uh, largely through, I think, unintended consequences. You see very often pieces of policy uh, that are framed for good with good intentions uh, that end up causing havoc in science uh, because uh, they're poorly framed or they're not framed with reference to the realities uh, of science. You could uh, take the immigration cap uh, as a very good example of this. Uh, another one would be the 
mushrooming of um, bureaucratic regulations around uh, medical research involving human subjects, uh, both of which have, I think, led to a large number of unintended consequences that have been negative. But actually, that's not my main um, point. My, uh, the, the, the main thing that I think is missing uh, is uh, a, 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 an appreciation of science as a pursuit, a process, a method, an approach, call it what you will, uh, that uh, I don't think goes nearly far enough uh, in public life. It's the appreciation of what Carl Sagan, I think, put very well when he said that science uh, is much more uh, than just a body of knowledge, it's a way of thinking, it's an approach to generating new knowledge uh, that is more reliable than any other uh, approach that we've yet developed for all of its flaws. Uh, and there are, of course, many of them. Scientists are human beings. We are uh, prone to uh, uh, all the errors of thought to which human beings uh, are prone. Science is in no way uh, infallible or certain. But uh, what it does do rather well is it erects uh, some, uh, if imperfect, roadblocks to those errors of thinking. Uh, tries to get around uh, confirmation bias, uh, cognitive distance, etc. All the sorts of things that very often lead us into uh, intellectual error. And I, th I don't think that that uh, appreciation of science as an approach is embedded nearly firmly enough uh, in either politics or the wider realm of public policy. And this, I think, leads to a number of uh, policy errors uh, that, um, that, that emerge. You have um, uh, politicians talking, uh, and civil servants for that matter, talking about making evidence-based policy when actually they prefer policy-based yes. evidence, um, the sort of evidence that tells them to do what they wanted to do uh, all along. You have a litany of different ways in which evidence is abused. Uh, uh, there's shopping around for evidence and cherry picking uh, uh, the bits that suit. Uh, there's my favourite, which is um, uh, what I call clairvoyant evidence, which is, uh, uh, was nicely summed up by an advisor to uh, Patricia Hewitt when she was health secretary, uh, who said that home births are safe and we will commission research to show that they're safe. <laughs> uh, there was a great, Tim Harford spotted a great example of this recently with John Hayes on wind farms, making a, a, a statement that was almost identical to that Hewitt <laughs> statement. Um, <coughs> you, you, you have, I think, a too little realisation that some of the experimental approaches that have been developed by uh, the sciences, and I include the social sciences in, within this very firmly, um, uh, actually are very applicable to uh, social issues as well. Why do we not use randomised controlled trials, for example, much more uh, than we do in issues such, in places such as the education system or the criminal justice system, where we actually don't know whether synthetic phonics is the best way to teach kids to read or not. Uh, but there are some very effective uh, uh, experiments that could be run to really settle that question. Um, and finally, uh, there is, as, as, as David Willits put uh, it to me while I was writing the book, there are many, uh, eventual, many instances where uh, the minister must act without good evidence. Volcanic ash would, for example, have been one of them. But um, when that happens, I think we need to have a realisation that the policy uh, that is introduced at that point is the starting point of a natural experiment. Uh, which we must then take pains to evaluate properly, to collect the data, uh, to get to a point where uh, we can actually learn from that experience uh, and, uh, and move on uh, to a position of, 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 of greater information. Uh, there are too many disincentives to evaluating policy properly in the system, uh, largely because, of course, uh, if you evaluate a policy properly, it may show you that it's not working and you ought to get rid of it. Um, I don't want to go on too long, but just uh, to, 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 to finish off, um, my thesis here is not uh, by any means uh, that evidence is the only factor that can decide sensible public policy. That is hardly ever the case. Uh, science and evidence are nearly always necessary to good decision making, but they're very, very rarely sufficient. And it's quite proper for politicians and indeed civil servants to bring in all sorts of other political factors. 
Uh, the, what I think they have to be clear on, though, is what are political factors, what are uh, factors that are based, uh, derived on uh, through values, and what are those that are reached from evidence, not to mix them up. Uh, that, I think, is very often where you end up with, uh, with, with problems. What I'm calling for here is certainly not uh, a technocratic uh, regime uh, whereby scientists uh, are deciding the show. What I really want to happen uh, is for scientists to be uh, more engaged uh, in the process of policy making and for uh, both politicians and civil servants to value rather more uh, the uh, approach to thinking uh, that I think scientists can provide. Um, I'll leave it there. I have further ideas about how that might be done, but uh, we we'll can get bring them up later. We'll definitely get into those later. So Chi, as a scientist who decided to get involved <laughs> in the policy <laughs> process through deciding to stand for election, which is a very brave way of trying to get involved, what's your, your perspective on this and your colleagues and Parliament? In its <laughs> <laughs> well, i just start by saying that I agree with, um, with much, if not all, of what Mark has been saying, but I do want to add to it from the perspective of a relatively new politician, two and a half years, but also as a professional engineer. I mean, twenty, for 23 years before I came into Parliament, I worked as an engineer mainly on uh, broadband and uh, telecommunications, and that's an experience which I should say can make the answers I get to questions um, from the Department of Culture and Media and sport at times are uh, hilarious <laughs> and at other times <laughs> quite tragic. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but I do want to start by saying that I think um, that over the last 15 years, much has improved in scientific um, advice to government uh, with a few bumps along the way. So um, there, this is not, it's not a party political discussion, but it was the last Labour government which introduced the current and, and, at the time, new and innovative system of providing scientific advice to government. So the modernising government white paper of 1999 stated that policy decisions should be based on sound evidence. Um, I do hope that had all party parliamentary agreement. Um, as a consequence, scientific advisors were installed in every Whitehall department and there was uh, routes for independent and expert advice in emergencies. Um, the last government also created the Office for Science and set a research funding frameworks for it outside of the usual spending envelopes. So this system has been copied since by the European Union, Japan and others. And following the, um, the notorious uh, David Nutt affair, um, Lord Drayson did set out principles for treatment of independent scientific advice about how ministers should approach academic freedom, independence of operation, and the proper consideration of advice from scientists. So a lot, I mean, I think a lot of the framework is there in place, and it is the right framework. Um, and the go this government is certainly not tearing up that approach, um, although it's not, equally it's not necessarily maintaining it as it should. I mean, for example, recent research from the House of Commons Library found that the government was using um, departmental R&D budgets as a way to save costs overall, you know, a, a hidden way to do that. And whilst that might not seem relevant to scientific advice directly, I think it's indicative of the way in which um, the government has, sees science, or ministers and some officials see science, that is as a target, not as an enabler. And I'm not saying that this is something which is unique to this government. Um, I was we were reading only yesterday that uh, one in ten children have played down their ability in science because they're afraid of being bullied, and equally one in five girls have played down their ability in maths for the same reason. Now, I remember that kind of pressure when I was uh, going to school many, many moons ago, uh, but I was hoping things had improved. And there is a clear relationship between what happens in the playground and what happens in government. And it's about... <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm uh, one of many relationships. Let me just uh, give you this one. <laughs> um, it's about the way in which science is valued in society. So. 
promoting the valuing of science and engineering in society is key to this. And it's one of the, um, the key themes in the science policy framework that I'm developing as the Shadow Minister mm -hmm. of Innovation in Science. So basically what I'm saying, you know, science and engineering, I'm sure you'd all agree with this, must be valued across our society. So if people do not value science, they will not value scientific advice. And as a consequence, neither will the people who are there to represent them, politicians. I mean, our democracy is by no means perfect, but politicians are accountable to the people in a way in which scientists and chief scientists, ad advisors, academics are not as representatives of the people. So I think it's important that we not only put in place good framework, good structures, some of which are, you know, are in place now, but that as a society we celebrate scientists and engineers. So I want to see a society where people are not proud that they're not very good at maths, or equally they're not bullied because they are good at it. I want to see a society where people from all backgrounds um, can grow up to be scientists and engineers, <laughs> and one where we value, for example, engineering diplomas, you know, you don't need to have a PhD to understand the scientific method, and technical qualifications, and more support for, and prizes for STEM awards, and equally where there are more scientists and engineers to be found in Parliament. Um, it's interesting that prior to last week's changeover, every single member of the Chinese Politburo was an engineer, <laughs> apart from one who was a geologist, which I consider a scientist. <laughs> now, I'm certainly not putting forward the Chinese <laughs> method <laughs> of government as an example to be followed, but I think it's true to say that you can deduce from the backgrounds of their top people what they consider to be important. So, as Mark said, in our uh, parliament, we have only a handful of scientists and engineers, and we certainly need par parliament to have a broader skills base. And also government. You know, I have lost count of the number of times I've put down parliamentary questions asking departments and their agencies, such as Ofcom, that I used to work for, um, how many engineers and scientists do you employ? And the answer comes back, we don't know. You know they don't track it. Um, and uh, we need to know the skills base that is there so that also we can track the progression of scientists and engineers through the civil service hierarchy. Equally, I've also uh, tabled many questions about chief scientific advisors. Um, last year, for example, I found out that the Department of Business didn't have a chief scientific advisor in place for six months. Clearly, wasn't missed. And um, in the Department for Culture, Media and Sports, the CSA post had been vacant for two years, which might explain some of the answers on broadband. Um, so, and of those departments, I think there's case research as well, cases are equally research into that, of those departments that did have chief scientific advisors in place, at least seven did not have full control over that department's research budget, and nine didn't have a seat on the management <coughs> department. Uh, board for that department, so um, a question of how, they are, how well they are valued arri arises. Um, so I've spoken you know, a bit about how we got where we are and recent developments. Um, you know, part of what we need to do tonight is look about the future and how we get to where we want to be, which I think we all in this room share this, a similar aim. Now, just to give an example, and I'm sorry, I didn't realise there was going to be somebody here from DEFRA, so I wasn't targeting you, but it was the most recent example. Um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a parliamentary debate on Badger if you, the Badger Cull, if you remember that, a couple of weeks ago, Owen Patterson, the Secretary of State for DEFRA, likened scientific research for a, um, a badger, um, for a vaccine, for TB for va in badgers, <laughs> to that of Sisyphus. I'm sure you're all aware that Sisyphus was the character from Greek mythology that had to roll a rock up a hill forever because it rolled down again and then his punishment was just to roll it up again. Um, somebody next to him on the government bench has act said that actually it was Tantalus that he meant. Uh, Tantalus uh, was, the, was the character who was tortured by having fruit and water out of his reach equally forever. <laughs> now, I mean, personally, I don't think it matters so much which figure he really meant, 
you know, what it showed was a view of s scientific research as, you know, an eternally pointless exercise. Uh, and I raised that with him in the House. Uh, but where were the outraged complaints from scientific institutions or learned bodies? You know, are scientists really content to be treated as, um, you know, tantalizing temptresses? Um, you know, so I believe, uh, it's not to put all the emphasis on that, but I believe that learned institutions uh, need to sh shout louder, you know, there are the representative bodies for uh, scientists and engineers, um, and they need to take more of a role, I would say, of a critical friend to government rather than a client organisation. Um, you know, this particular case showed a complete lack of understanding of the importance of science and scientific advice, and I would think that that should have been pounced on by learned institutions, scientists, and the media. Um, equally, and this is you know, last year, Theresa May shut down the forensic science service without even asking the ad advice of the chief scientific advisor or the forensic science regulator. So those were, you know, those were signs of steps backwards. Um, and in an example, the Science and Technology Committee found last year that scientists' big advice was something that ministers look to. Um, there needs to be something that ministers look to in the pro as part of the process, as Mark says, um, as for events and policies, and not just in emergencies. So, yeah, I think, as I said, we're probably most of us in the room are agreed that scientific advice and science uh, needs to be a more integral part of politics and the political process. It's how we achieve that that matters. What I would say is that we need to change the way in which science is valued and perceived, and that's something that scientists and engineers yeah. and their supporters need to stand up and shout loudly about. Okay, thank you very much, Chi. Now, we're going to the inside government uh, view. I did promise uh, Katrina that she wasn't here to be grilled on badger colour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she did agree to I'm do not. this. Um, she's not. Uh, nor to be culled herself, but I think it's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, anyway. Uh, I know when I joined DEFRA, I worked for ages at the Treasury, and Treasury does economics, and economics is sort of relatively easy to understand. And I was really... <laughs> <laughs> Just not to implement. Um, not to implement, but you know... Uh, and you can never tell whether it makes any difference anyway, but uh, it's mm -hmm. one simple idea. But, uh, but I remember when I went to DEFRA, I was really quite frightened as a, uh, as a generalist, uh, a non-scientist. Actually, what did you do with all these scientists telling you things that you probably could actually barely understand, let alone question? Uh, but I never got very far in DEFRA, but Katrina is now <laughs> heading <laughs> strategy, evidence, and consumers. So Katrina... Uh, how do you think DEFRA uses science? Do you think some of the points here about science being a bit too marginal, um, and people generally using science a bit a la carte, do you think uh, that reflects experience in DEFRA? Def or well, I, I, I don't, to be honest. I mean, I have to say, Jill, when you invited me to come along because of what I wasn't, <laughs> I couldn't resist <laughs> the invitation. I am, as Jill says, uh, an English graduate. Um, I am not, however, going to talk about Greek mythology in any <laughs> sense, because I don't understand that and wouldn't <laughs> presume to. Um, but I have spent much of my career in the civil service working very closely with both scientists and other sorts of specialists. Um, and um, I, I have found that to be <coughs> an utterly productive experience. Um, indeed, at the moment I was made something called the Director of Transmissible Spongiform Encephalopathy <laughs> and Zoonoses. It became a matter of survival. Um, and I've done a lot of things in my career, including negotiating the lifting of uh, bans on the exports of British beef, which I absolutely could not have done without an understanding of and a very productive relationship with uh, a multitude of scientists in different disciplines. So um, I really am a fan, and I think um, uh, particularly in DEFRA, it's integral to what we do. So I thought what I would do is just share a few sort of practical uh, lessons from a policymaker's perspective about how policymakers can work better with scientists and other specialists. 
and then talk very briefly about three challenges that are bugging me at the moment, um, with the hope that actually the audience will be able to help me with some of the solutions. Um, first of all, the lessons um, about what I've learned over the years. Um, I think the first and one of the most important ones is both sides need to give each other permission to ask the dumb question. Actually, I have found that some of the most productive discussions I have ever had with specialists have been at the moment when I have given the complete layperson's response, have asked a really, really dumb question um, about a particular situation, and discovered that actually there were some assumptions there that we shouldn't necessarily have been making. So I think one of the rules of, um, of, uh, of working together between policymakers and specialists needs to be that permission that you can ask any question, no matter how stupid, and pursue it to, to the ultimate uh, distance. Linked to that, I think, is, is something about um, recognizing and respecting cultural differences. When I started working with scientists in government, one of the things that was most striking to me was the way that they sort of appeared to fly at each other's throats quite regularly and have <laughs> absolute bitter ding-dongs um, to the extent where I used to wonder whether I should perhaps intervene, you know, for sort of health and safety reasons. <laughs> but, but then discovered that actually at the end of all this, they, 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 would, they would pal up and walk off arm in arm. <laughs> and and that, to me, that was a very important thing for me to recognise because it was about the nature of scientific debate, the putting up of a hypothesis, then to be attacked, and <coughs> the way in which that helps you to test um, a, a hypothesis. But actually, when talking to policymakers about engaging with scientists, that's one of the things that you have to understand, is that a bit of rough and tumble is all part of the game. Um, I think the other cultural um, issue to recognise um, is the one about all scientists not being the same. And the thing that has always um, baffled and frustrated me is the dichotomy between uh, those who regard themselves as pure scientists and those who are applied scientists. Um, and actually, I think as a policymaker, one of the few things that I've been able to do is to say to them, actually, you're both valuable in different ways and in different parts of the, of the process. So I think actually recognizing some of those differences. And then using that to try and find a common language. Actually, one area where policymakers and, and scientists can work really well is around how you describe risk and actually how you then have conversations with um, decision makers uh, about risk and how you then communicate risk um, to the public. And for me, that's been a really mm. positive area, which is about working out how you're going to describe that in terms of language. Extremely important to invest time up front in any process in making sure that you are asking the right question. Um, I was very struck by what Mark said about the tendency to ask the question that gets the answer that you think you want to have. Um, and that's always a temptation if you are a policy maker. So actually drilling down what question is it that you really need to answer is very important. And as a policy maker, I would say that sometimes nailing down scientific colleagues to something as definitive as a question, you know, can be part of the challenge. But you really have to invest the time up front, or you will end up with something that isn't the very best evidence base you can possibly have. And finally, on my list of lessons, it's not just about the scientists. Um, actually, earlier on, Mark talked about science as being very broad. It's about social science, too. Most policy decisions are about a combination of factors, some of which are about um, uh, economics, some of which are about um, science, some of which will be about behavioral science, some of which will be about the sheer feasibility of doing something. And actually, the best policy making brings all of that together and has teams who are willing to say, it isn't me you need, 
it's a different sort of specialist to help you with this. And that's one of the interesting things to me about um, working in, in DEFRA is that we now have multidisciplinary teams working in different policy areas. And that's been a very productive thing because you do find people doing the handoff to say, it's not me who's the expert, you need to go to the person over there. Challenges for the future. I think in a world of very tight resources, there is always more that we can do than there are um, resources to do it. Um, I think the risk is that that tends to make us more prescriptive about what we think we're looking for. Um, and one of my big fears is that actually, you know, as we start to allocate budgets uh, out to, to various different pieces of work, um, we lose that space that um, all pure scientists tell me you very much need, which is the bit where you are just able to create innovation because the question isn't too prescriptive. Um, that, for me, is a really big challenge, I think, for us in government. Uh, and I'd love to have people's views on it. Um, one of the ways that we have dealt with it in DEFRA is to make sure that we keep back uh, for our chief scientists, mm -hmm. some unallocated money, which can then be used to flex around some of these, these issues. But if anybody's got a better solution, I'd love to know. I think one of the other challenges is for us um, in, in future in, in the civil service and in government is, is actually about honing our skills uh, around using other people's work. So actually not just being clever commissioners of work, but actually being clever at spotting work and about making links between work um, and about being able to do that thing of peer reviewing work that is drawn from a wide range of, of sources. And I think that has some implications for how we attract and train and retain the scientific expertise that we've been very accustomed to have in the civil service. So I think that's, that's quite a big strategic question for me. Um, and I think there are eternal questions about how, um, in a policy-making context, you can make use of work which has been done by commercial companies. I was talking to a major food manufacturer last week. They undoubtedly know a lot about nutrition, but actually how can you make sure that they are not um, uh, asking the skewed question and that the work that they have um, is, is of a nature that you can then use and fold into the, the wider policy piece. And the final challenge, and it's a perennial one, is the one about communicating science. Um, actually, the one thing about being an English graduate is that over the years I've asked so many dumb <coughs> questions that I've actually seen quite a lot of my colleagues get better at explaining things to me. Uh, so, you know, if I can claim nothing else, maybe I can claim that. Um, to end on, on what I hope is an upbeat note, the first thing I did when Jill invited me to come here tonight was that I asked a scientist what I should say. In fact, I asked DEFRA's very own Miles Parker, the Deputy Chief Scientific Advisor, uh, what I should say. And here I should pay tribute to Miles because at the end of this year, he will be retiring after a long, distinguished career of keeping generations of policymakers on the straight and narrow <laughs> as far as science is concerned. Anyway, this, the, the response I got from Miles was quite interesting. Uh, first of all, he said, I hope to be in the audience and will ask difficult questions. <laughs> See what I mean about scientists being stroppy and combative? You know, so we're off to a good start. Then he said, this has been set up as a culture clash, but actually this is more of a category error. <laughs> and I thought, do I understand that? So I went off and I asked another scientist, and he said he didn't understand it either. However, I then read a little further into Miles' email. Um, and actually, what Miles was, was, was saying was really that um, good policy is done by teams, and that those teams will bring a range of strengths. And it's about drawing on experiential sources as well as formal sources. And that's the point at which you can get a really productive interaction between policymakers um, and scientists. So actually, it's about creating that virtuous circle. Um, as ever, 
the advice I had from my scientific colleagues was the <laughs> thing that finally cracked it for me. <laughs> very, very helpful, and thank you, Miles. <laughs> Thanks for my answer. Rod, there's a team at DFT integrating scientific... Maybe. I, I'll leave, <coughs> let me leave that for a moment. Uh, I don't know where to start. Um, I'm not a scientist, even though I'm chief scientific advisor. I'm an engineer, and there's a big difference mm. between scientists mm. and engineers. I wonder how many people in the room are absolutely confident they can define the difference between science and engineering. Be careful, if you put your hand up, I might ask mm. you to, uh, <laughs> to, to say, say so. And if you think it's anything to do with repairing washing machines, keep your hand down. <laughs> <laughs> well, very broadly, I was told at the beginning of my engineering career that engineering is the art of being approximately right rather than exactly wrong. <laughs> now actually that's, that's quite profound and it has some connections with politics if you think about it. Science is the process of discovering physical truths that are generally speaking the inviolate laws of nature, although long experience tells us we can change them. Engineering is about the debate about getting things done. It's not, it's not about the rarefied atmosphere of pure scientists, which is a term that I've heard used today. So engineering advice is, is quite different. The second thing I was told at the beginning of my engineering career was, if in doubt, ask. Now this is very difficult when you're young and inexperienced because it sort of exposes uh, a weakness. But actually, the further you get in your career, the more confident you are in asking, asking the right question, which is something that's been uh, said today. So I, I'd like you to bear in mind the difference between engineering advice and scientific advice. And you, the term science has been used very loosely tonight and actually what we need is more sound engineering advice because that's what makes the world work. <laughs> <laughs> because engineering's about doing things, not talking about things. <laughs> I was tempted um, because of the preamble of this meeting to go back and read C.P. Snow's Two Cultures okay. lecture okay. from 1950. I have a copy here. Uh, 1959, I was just starting grammar school and I was a, a keen young man imbued with the idea that science was the answer to all our problems. And it was a sort of hangover from the post-war era where there was a view that it was science what won the war, to put it crudely, and of course the development of things like radar and ultimately the bomb and so on had some major part in that and the many difficult decisions had to be made about using technology <coughs> in um, all sorts of violent ways. I was brought up in an era that saw great hope in nuclear energy for example that was going to produce cheap and uh, successful energy. Because of the links with the weapons program and nuclear energy that has not come to pass in the way that we hoped it did and I think actually in the, in the middle age and older psyche that's a very important example of the sort of breakdown in the confidence of science and engineering being an answer to all our problems. Very very important role that it's uh, played amongst all the people and it's, there's a hangover now in really big issues like climate change where all sorts of tumpney hapney commentators can put in the two penneth in broadsheet newspapers. I read some piece on in Sunday's time, Saturday's Times about burning wood, which was completely wrong. And, you know, it was published and nobody sort of questioned it. Actually, there are some letters in today questioning it. But the fact that the article was published at all is quite surprising. So the level at which that debate is carried out actually mirrors C.P. Snow's worry that there are there is great divide between the knowledge of intelligent sophisticated trained uh, 
arts graduates and scientists who, uh, who, who uh, only know about their own subject. But he took that view forward and said, how is it that informed discussions can be made about matters as important as the development of things like nuclear weapons, now put in brackets, climate change, GM crops and so on, um, if there is no intercourse between these two disciplines. And he said even further, it's very, very dangerous to rely on the advice of single chief scientists. He didn't call them chief scientists. He, he said, um, you know, chief scientists can get it wrong because there's a matter of opinion to it. So we need a much broader debate. And so my worries go back to the whole business of educating generations of young people in maths and science. I really think we should extend PPE degrees to physics, philosophy and engineering. <laughs> <laughs> We specialise far too early. We seem to have lost the knack of teaching kids basic maths that they can take on into their lives and be confident about. Indeed, it's, it's a, a badge of sort of pride that the Simon Jenkins of this world can write in broadsheets. I don't know any <laughs> maths. Who needs, you know, differential equations and quadratic equations? Waste of time. Well, you know, the depth of ignorance is quite unbelievable. Now, uh, just a quick uh, interaction with the audience. How many of you would claim to be scientists here? Or scientists? Quite a large scattering. It's surprising. That mm. it's really very it's Surprising audience. and it's very, very encouraging. And it's, it's also encouraging <laughs> to see so many younger faces. I'm used in engineering to uh, addressing audiences comprising very old men, usually. So I'm very encouraged <laughs> by this, this audience. So I want to exclude the scientists from this question. How many of the non-scientists here are confident they could clearly differentiate between weight and mass? You're, not, you're an engineer. Well, okay, well, that's <laughs> so. <laughs> I made the distinction and fell into my own trap. Let me exclude the, let me exclude the engineers as well. Now, how many of the non technically trained people could clearly distinguish between weight and mass. I mean, this is C.P. Snow's equivalent of saying, can you read? And we've got all sorts of technical decisions which are going to involve communications, new types of telephones, and uh, we've got the, the, the whole debate about climate, the way we might produce our energy in different sort of ways, um, irrespective of how we might pay for it. There are some very fundamental bits of physics that need to be understood before you can really contribute to these debates. So the world is getting more complicated at an exponential rate, and that really worries me. So I really am um, an advocate of encouraging younger people to learn about maths and science, not necessarily to have their careers in maths and science, but to have enough intelligence to be able to debate it properly at school and not forget learning about it at 12 or 13 or some ridiculously early age that we do, which is not mirrored in other countries. I mean, China's been mentioned. I'm not quite sure we want so many engineers in the cabinet. <laughs> uh, China, Japan, Germany, USA, the representation of engineers would be much, much greater than it is here. And whose fault is this? It's our fault, the engineers for not really getting involved in the process and uh, uh, putting ourselves to, uh, to be elected for parliament, which I compliment our, our, our colleague on. So we, we've really got a lot of work to do. Uh, just to finish on what the cha chief scientific advisor and the role in transport, well, transport is a, a really big issue that affects all our lives. And many of the decisions that are going to be made in the future have at least a strong element of technology in them and technological possibilities. Actually more driven by information technology in the future than the physics of how the, the car engine works and so on. And 
big issues about alternative fuels. So th there's a big job to involve society in what might well be a series of rather difficult choices which constrain a choice that they've always regarded as being a natural freedom, not to travel around freely, regardless of the consequences. So the mixture of social science with the, the technical issues mean we, we've got um, an exciting time ahead of us um, which needs to engage a very broad scientific and technical base as well as the social, political and economic base to come up with some answers. And I'll end there, perhaps elaborate later if there's an opportunity. Just very quickly to, to the two within government. When you've got, we can have this sort of long run which we need to be actually be, you know, be in a country where you don't give up physics at 13, she said, speaking for ourselves, which is why I can't <laughs> answer your mass and weight question. Because um, it was so appallingly badly taught, I would say, in my defence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's perfectly acceptable to do that and do other things instead. Yeah. Um, whatever. I was just intrigued. You've got ministers. I mean, um, the minister, I think, is a former miner. Your previous minister was an accountant. Mm. Um, got minister, I'm not sure what Owen Patterson does. He's Landed, I'm not quite sure what he's going. But how do you engage with them? <laughs> how, do you not engage, Greek mythology. how do you engage with them on these quite technical issues? How do you sort of take them there, given that you can't rewind and say, well, if you hadn't given up physics at 13, <laughs> you'd start to understand what I'm talking about. I mean, how can you make this a thing where they can actually have a sensible debate and discussion about it, as opposed to just have to switch off and just say, well... Well, of course, it, it's, it, it's quite difficult, and probably the best approach is not to tell them how thick they are, uh, <laughs> to, be, to begin with, anyway, uh, and to, to break the news to them gently. Um, and, and, and hope by the time they've realised it, they will have moved on to another... No, ser seriously, that, that really was a joke. And my minder from the department is here. And, and absolutely cringing at things that I'm saying. So I've got to be... Sorry about that. Okay. You've, got to be, you've got to be very careful. And, and it's a difficult job. I think it takes time, yeah. and actually, um, you know, most of the ministers that I have worked with have, have acknowledged that it takes time. You need to have the right people in the room. Um, and I think it is about finding that language <coughs> that will help them to the heart of the issue. Um, I mean, to give one example of a, of a difficult issue that we have to um, handle in DEFRA, it was the ending of a de an EU derogation that had allowed us to apply our own controls to pets imported into the country in recognition of, of um, the UK's rabies-free status. Um, difficult decisions for ministers <coughs> about actually was the ending of the derogation something that we could live with in terms of the degree of risk that that would entail, an increased risk that that would entail. Um, finding a, a matrix through which you could talk to ministers about the risk compared to the risk of doing other things was quite a useful key to doing that. And bringing into the room the, the different experts who would be able to talk to you, A, about the risk in terms of the disease, but also the mitigations that you might make in terms of the practicalities that would help you to live with that. But it takes time, and actually, you need to invest time, and ministers need to be prepared to invest time in that. So I think the key thing would be to tell them that they need to do that. OK, right, we're going to throw it open to questions. We'll take them sort of in bunches of three. If there's anyone in the other room who wants to ask a question, they need to come in, come in here. So let's go, let's go right the back, seems to be full of people who want to ask questions. So we'll go <laughs> far corner there, and if you could just say who you are. Simon, she said. <laughs> <laughs> Simon Burrow I'm from Science um, Fire is going to do that anyway. So, okay. I'm a Simon. Uh, a director of Involve and also uh, head of public dialogue at ScienceWise. I thought it was quite interesting when you were talking about transport and the need to mix up um, both uh, uh, scientific evidence with social evidence and so on. I guess I'm just wondering kind of where and how the public voice comes into all of this because what you were talking about is m significant changes to the public's lifestyle and how do you take this incredibly technical scientific language and match it against evidence that comes from what the public are saying, whether through formal engagement processes or because of Twitter, how do you begin to balance up these different forms of evidence? Okay, we'll hold that and then we'll go down there. Yes, 
tell us who you are. Yeah. Bob Ward from the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and Environment at LSE. Um, can I ask the panel's opinion about the letter that Bob Kerslake sent to John Krebs last month, confirming that um, due to downsizing in departments, CSAs can no longer be, be expected to be appointed at the level of DG or Perm Sec. Now, in the letter, uh, uh, Sir Bob said that that didn't signify a downgrading of the CSA's role, but it certainly looks like that, simply because it, it means they won't be sitting on the departmental board. It, does, does the panel think that this is important or not? Okay, and... Jim Mulvey, I'm a government scientist for the MOD. Um, my question's a bit more slightly related to one of these about the kind of... We said that scientists need to engage more mm. with politicians and the, and the policy making, but my question is, if you look at behavioural sciences, um, people <laughs> behave how they're rewarded. So politicians get rewarded for thinking in the short term, mm. so they get re-elected. So does science need to, and engineers need to redesign the way that um, the policy system and policy making system works <laughs> so that we can scrutinise that evidence in a more effective way and, and question the politicians and people um, more effectively and allow the public engagement system, especially when we have counterintuitive um, evidence that uh, is counterintuitive and not comfortable for the public. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's have a go at, uh, at some of those. Rod, do you want to take on this point about um, Bob Kerslake's letter on the chief scientist? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm w not uh, terribly exercised <coughs> by it at all. I, um, you know, attending the, the board meeting of the department is something I might do if we're discussing something interesting. <laughs> it's not something that I want to have uh, a permanent blockage in my diary for. for one's got to be selective I, I, I'm not sure um, it, w it will be difficult to get people of any sort of calibre if, um, mm. if um, financial rewards are pared down and so on I think that's probably more important than whether you're on the board or not um, I mean, as it is you know, we're, we're invited to dinners and have to the hat is passed around for us to contribute to the wine, and if you've tasted the wine, you realise what an insult that is. <laughs> but I mean, that, yeah, you know, t we live in hard times, so I guess we've got to accept these sort of things. I mean, where, what's happening in DEFRA? Is, uh, uh, in well, in, in, in DEFRA, um, we have just appointed a new chief scientific advisor, um, Professor Ian Boyd, who is a DG level appointment. Yeah. Now, I think that reflects the uh, the importance of um, science in, in the DEFRA agenda. Um, but I think I would say, actually, it's how well you integrate the individual in the policy-making mm -hmm. process um, that matters most, um, rather than what grade that individual is mm. at. And I have seen some very, very successful and influential mm. scientists mm operating at a range of different mm. levels mm. Um, in government. So um, I wouldn't be too hung up about it, um, you know, despite the fact that we do in fact have a DG level chief scientist. It slightly depends what's in the agenda of the departmental it board, does. because if they're not talking about policy, it but may not be where they want to be. But I think there's a, but, but the point that you haven't picked up, mm. actually Rod, Rod touched on it a bit, mm. was and, and she touched on it a lot when she was talking about it, is actually the, the, the issue about status and about the status of science within the department if mm. the most senior scientist in the department is not one of the most senior people in the department. I think that sends quite an important message out there about what is valued. Would you have, um, I don't know, the most senior economist or whatever Aren't at a boards, level a lot of of departments. Yes. Well, okay, well, maybe that's yes, wrong too. Not. But uh, mm. it's, it, I, th I do think that level is, is quite important there. Okay, well, what about these uh, coming on to that? I think there's a bit of sort of juries out there to, to be watched, I think, as an issue. It's mm. quite interesting in your book. I mean, Bob Watson says very much that he prizes his seat well, on the that's department right, board yeah. as a meaning sure that he is there for valuable policy discussions, whether that's quite the right forum now with the change in boards following the, uh, following the changes that the, this government introduced. What about this point that Simon, uh, Simon was bringing in and relating a bit about uh, to the point about the political <coughs> system? 
I mean, when you're looking at things, yeah. I mean, she, when you've got some issue coming up and you're there, you're technically trained, I think is now the word we're doing to embrace <laughs> this new community we just created. <laughs> you're technically trained. You see your colleagues under pressure to maybe do a sort of slightly knee-jerk populist response or whatever <laughs> that you know isn't perhaps as evidence-based. I mean, how do you sort of weigh these different sources of evidence? Um, well, I, think I, I thought that was a very interesting but I'm not sure entirely scientific use of it, behavioral science <laughs> to, say that, um, to say that people um, respond to how they are rewarded. Um, you know, that may be too true in a kind of um, sort of base technocratic term, but people are very compl people are complex and politicians are complex as well, and the rewards are, nu are numerous. So um, whilst there is a lot of pressure, there can be a lot of pressure to respond um, immediately and um, in a knee-jerk reaction. The criticism for responding in a knee-jerk reaction and the criticism, for example, that our lights will go out in five years. This government will leave power, uh, I hope, in 2015. Um, if, the lights go, if, if there is a serious prospect that the lights in this country go out in 2017 because there isn't a, a long-term energy uh, policy in place, that will be um, a serious criticism, which one would, I would expect, you know, even the media in this country would pick up. So it is, it is I think, I don't think, I, I don't accept, if you like, criticism for responding to people's interests and the people that I'm meant to be representing, but their interests are both short-term and long-term, <coughs> and it's making sure that the, um, that the debate and the environment recognises that. So Mark, I you've got some suggestions for institutional well, trainers, haven't you? I think, we, I think politics gets done by those who turn up. And Rod mentioned it mm -hmm. brilliantly earlier mm -hmm. when he said, who's to blame for engineering not being at the heart of government policy? More than anybody else, it's engineers. And the same is true, I think, for science and those of us who care <laughs> uh, about science, that it is about engaging. Now, I don't think that there are very many politicians out there in the UK who are meaningfully anti-science. There is only one David Tredinick. Um, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> but um, th the uh, problem is that, is that far too few politicians, and actually far too few civil servants, have really any uh, kind of constructive engagement with science. And that does, I think, partly stem from the fact that there are very few incentives for them to do so, electorally or uh, in the sense that they, they see it as something that there is widespread public uh, demand for. Yeah. And uh, I think it's absolutely critical for those of us who see these issues as particularly important uh, to be active in behaving as good citizens around them and, and actually telling our MPs uh, that these are important. Uh, I think that we need to do far more on institutional levels to, uh, in higher education to connect up um, academics of all sorts actually, not just scientists, who have policy relevant research with the civil servants who are actually doing that policy. I think that's what uh, CSAP, is uh, Centre for Science and Policy in Cambridge, does particularly well and far too few universities actually have a body like that. They, they've all got knowledge transfer offices which connect up researchers with, uh, with business, but actually where are the knowledge transfer offices for public policy? I think these are terribly important things to, uh, to get going on. So I wanted to make one more observation which is not from one of the questions, but uh, it struck me that of course the author of the piece that Rod was uh, taking part in the Times last weekend is, I believe, one of the principal sources of scientific advice for your Secretary of State. <laughs> anyway, let's... Matt Ridley? <laughs> <laughs> right, anyway, um, I was going to do a quote rather than you. I think we need to, need to remember Simon's point about weighing sort of different sorts of evidence. We'll come back to it when we've done. So let's come here. Kerry? Yeah. Um, Tell us who you are. Yeah, Michael Hallsworth. I was at the Institute writing a series of reports on improving policy making. Something that actually just came up there was, and was implicit in Rod's uh, uh, talk, was the role of the media. Um, how important do you think this is if, on the basis that ministers may listen to the media, mm -hmm. and if you don't have many scientists writing stories, can we expect them perhaps represent science uh, in a 
to a high degree of accuracy. And question for Mark, how many scientists are there in the House of Lords? Um, and what role do you think the House of Lords plays currently? And what are the limits of that role? Because it's often thought of that the scrutiny from scientists comes at that stage of the legislative process. OK, yeah, let's go forward. We've got lots of questions coming here, so just do short cut yes. OK. Uh, Tony Gillespie from DSTL, another MOD scientist. Um, we heard a lot said about the lack of scientific knowledge among the decision makers, policy makers and the like. Is there actually another side of the coin that we should make sure that scientists and engineers especially do have some education in the way of getting the message over mm -hmm. to non-scientists mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we have a lot of training in talking to other scientists but very little or none, only hard experience of talking to people who have no concept of scientific methodology. Okay, and let's have one more in this little clutch. If we just come forward here. No, I'm waving up to the next. Ah, yes. Okay. I'm uh, Roland Jackson, British Science Association and, uh, and ScienceWise. Uh, and a question sort of initially, I guess, for, for Rod Smith, and others might like to comment. You, you, you drew quite clear distinctions, as, as many do, between scientists and, and engineers. Do you think it makes a difference in a particular department if the CSA is one or the other? I mean, it may reflect the balance of activity in that department. And a sort of supplementary is, would it make a significant difference, or what sort of difference might it make if the chief scientist himself or herself were an engineer rather than a scientist? Okay. Rod, well, do you want to come in on uh, that one? Okay. The other two slightly more general questions. Um, look, looking at um, most of the appointments that I can remember, <laughs> um, very few engineers amongst them in the, in the past, they tend to be scientists. Science is put on a sort of pedestal, you know, if you're a fellow of the Royal Society, you're next to God. And I know lots of fellows of the Royal Society, I wouldn't even bother asking about the football results to <laughs> I mean, and, 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 and vice versa, there's a whole spectrum of abilities and differences. Um, I think the communications point actually it joins in with it. I mean, I, it is absolutely vital that we have informed, intelligent, and amusing comment, uh, as, as long as it's sound, of course, um, in the media because it's such a potent um, source of information. Unfortunately, timescales are so short, and, and w one rather deplores the sort of instant comment about everything before you've got a chance to engage your brain. You know, you're asked, why has this happened? Why has that happened? And to just say, well, we need to just pause and try and find out is not, not a good enough answer, but often it's the right answer. But people are rather reluctant to have that on the record. But uh, you're certainly training in this sort of area. It would be very valuable. So, Mark, it's all media's fault. <laughs> no, 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 I'm so not saying that. No, I'm not saying that. No, 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 no. Just, uh, I'm taking Mike's yeah. point. That so, th for those of you who don't know, I was, I was science editor of the Times for 11 years before I joined the Wellcome Trust. But uh, it's, it's, it's an important point, the media. And, and uh, the media does often get it wrong. And, um, uh, but uh, equally, uh, we, we can't uh, aspire towards some media utopia where um, every scientific... Uh, article is done absolutely correctly either. We are where we are. And again, I think a lot of this boils down to engagement, actually. Um, the majority of journalists, I do think, want to get things right. And uh, when scientists engage or engineers engage with them constructively, it generally makes for better copy and better results and it mm. goes to your mm. point about communication which I think is, is, is very very um, important. What I think um, is a bigger problem with the media though that in some ways mirrors politics uh, and, and, and the civil service is actually the shortage of people with any kind of scientific or technical background uh, mm. at senior level. Mm. Now um, if you uh, look at those stats for the House of Commons and then you transfer to Fleet Street editors and executives or senior levels of the BBC, you will find a very similar ratio. Mm. Uh, and I think that's rather important when it comes to the place that science occupies in the kind of national conversation. And uh, to illustrate this, uh, Rob, um, 
My favourite statistic of the moment is that in the past two years, Melanie Phillips has been on Question mm. Time more often than all scientists put together, <laughs> which I think says something rather interesting. It's not just Melanie Phillips. There have been more pop stars than scientists, more uh, cultural figures. The Bonnie Greers and, and Will Selfs are always being asked to comment on politics. Scientists, not so much. And I think that's rather sad, and it's, uh, it, it's because, I think, there is this culture at, at, at the top of the media that almost says, well, yes, science, you can have your show with Brian Cox over there, but don't presume to comment on the big issues of the day. And I, I think that's a shame. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just wanted to say that um, it, that's, you know, I forgot to mention the Science Media Centre, which was also set up over the last government, to make better um, information on scientific debates and subjects available to journalists. But there is a real issue about the, um, again, the value of science as seen by the media. I held a debate on the representation of science in the public um, service broadcasting a, a, a month ago. And my point was really that I think the science programs are great. So the BBC, uh, um, Channel 4 um, do some fantastic science programs, but it is somewhat ghettoized. And if you look at the representation of science and engineering in the general programming, and I include the Today program in that, and Women's Hour and other general programs, there is very uh, little, there's relatively little informed debate about scientific issues or engineers or scientists represented on that. And again, I think it comes down to the value, how science and engineering is valued. And just to say, we, we saw there are quite a m number of scientists in this room. How many people in this room are members of some learned institution or other? Yeah, yeah. so quite a few. I'm a member of the, uh, of, uh, of the IET, the Institution of Engineering and Technology. I always use them as an example. They, you know, as a member of them for many, many years, they don't offer um, media training. They offer training in the latest um, telecoms or the latest wireless technology, mm -hmm. etc. They don't offer um, media training, and they also don't encourage, and I think they should, or more encourage scientists and engineers to write to their MPs. Because believe me, once you've got a long letter from a <laughs> constituent about some complex scientific issue, you will be better informed at the end of it. Well, you or your researcher will be. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but even so, that's a contribution to the level of scientific <laughs> understanding. What about this point about the House of Lords, Mark, that Mike mm. was making? I mean, is the House of Lords, yeah, we've got this relatively scientifically this illiterate House of Commons. Is the House of Lords the, the salvation? Uh, <laughs> it's not the salvation. There's certainly more of them. Uh, I don't have statistics um, on exactly how many, but it's, it's in the, the several dozen, certainly, mm. and there's good, very good people like John Krebs, Martin Rees, etc., who I think do a great job. And certainly, if you look back to some of the bigger public policy debates, um, so take the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act a few years ago, the quality of the debate in the House of Commons was frankly embarrassing whereas mm -hmm. the House of Lords made some really significant and important revisions. But we can't leave it to that, surely. And, uh, and actually, um, particularly with, I mean, okay, Lords Reform has been part for now, but um, who knows where that's going to go. There is potentially a loss of expertise mm -hmm. there. And secondly, I, I think important as it is and, and valuable as it is, uh, it's too important just to leave to the Lords, in my, in my view. Okay, let's, let's have a few more questions. Oh, let's go here, because there are some women who want to ask questions. Yes, yeah, the women are all on yeah. the right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Uh, hello, uh, my name's Anna Barnes. I'm a clinical healthcare scientist at uh, UCH. Um, actually, my question is about um, the idea that we should shout more and be, mm. have more of a public face. Um, Look at what happened to those scientists in Italy recently. <laughs> they ended up getting a very mm. huge prison mm. sentence for, and I haven't seen any policymakers go to prison. Um, so that was quite a tough uh -huh. lesson to learn. And it certainly <laughs> made me think twice about things. Okay, that's an interesting challenge. Um, yes. Hi, uh, I'm, uh, sorry, I'm Hannah Bodmer from the Department of Business Innovation and Skills, and I'm also a scientist and a medic who works there. I, I mean, one of the questions that's maybe a comment or maybe for asking for experience from, mm. from other people is sometimes there's a bit of a feeling that if you have a very sort of 
have had a scientific or medical or both career as I have before I went into the civil service, that you almost get typecast and you get a bit narrow to that field. So I have been told I can't be as generally scientifically literate as a generalist because, because I'm a medical researcher now. <laughs> so it is really, really just a question about how do you take that because actually generalists can, can be generalists but can scientists be generalists as well? I mean, that's, that's my position at the moment, is a generalist position. I'm used very much as a specialist. So what have you been denied the opportunity to do that you'd have liked to have done? I'm not sure I have, because I am so grounded in my background that I okay. like to work in that area. But, but you know, to branch it out, to widen it out, to, to, to broaden yeah. the science in general and not always be sort of stuck. I'm, <coughs> I'm not, I have to say, in my unit. That Okay, right, and one more, just here, she said, it's completely random. Yes. Uh, uh, Brian Robinson from uh, TRL, the Transport Research Laboratory. Um, I, I'd like to pick up on the, uh, I think what Mark um, kicked off, and that's the nature of politics in the UK uh, and its adversarial mm. nature. Mm. Surely is completely opposed um, because it relies on people arguing with each other based on their philosophy and beliefs and having to set clear lines between each other in order to get votes. Uh, and then once they've started to say, uh, express an extreme view, <coughs> they tend to have to stick to it for years afterwards because they get called hypocrites or they're U-turning if they yeah. don't. Science is about discovering the truth or at least narrowing the range of possible truths. And engineering is about applying those narrowing range of truths. So one tries to focus and, and narrow down. The other is always looking for extremes. Uh, and I think that's, that's really part of the problem, and it's certainly why I can understand lots of scientists and engineers would be put off going into politics. Okay, well, we'll we might come back towards that at the end. This point first rolled about the, I don't know what discussion there was in the government science community about this Lal Keela verdict on the well, uh, scientists. There was a quite an animated discussion at a breakfast meeting we had about its, um, <laughs> its implications. Um, and I, sp I spoke to the Italian <coughs> charge d'affaires who is concerned with science here in, 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 in London about it. At one level it's serious, but at the other level it, re it represents a sort of um, process that's going on in Italy, which is, I, d I don't think, going to be generalised. But, I mean, it, uh, um, <coughs> so I'd, I'm not too concerned that we, we need to um, uh, lock, lock ourselves in... Uh, in a safe room before the, the police come. I can think of lots of people who I'd like to send to prison <coughs> in advance of my uh, technical and engineering colleagues. Um, in fact, a very long list. <laughs> but I don't think it's too serious here. I think it'll be rectified in Italy too. It will be seen to be ridiculous. After all, Galileo was put on trial. Yes. There's a long history of it there. Yes, there's, there's, <laughs> there's, there's a fine global tradition. <laughs> Maybe it reflects different expectations of scientists to policy. Yeah. So what about this point about the sort of, you know, are scientists sort of stuck? And I, know, I think it, I mean, picking up the point that Tony made earlier, I think it's very important that they shouldn't be stuck, not only in terms of, um, you know, being trained to communicate with, um, you know, policy makers who might not understand science, um, but I think it's, it's very important that actually those who want to make a career in science do have an opportunity to experience the policy making part of it. Um, because I think that can be uh, seriously enriching. I was talking to our um, chief veterinary officer for the UK the other day, who um, is, as the name implies, a vet but actually who had, at a critical point in his career, a couple of policy jobs that were nothing to do with veterinary science, um, and actually feels that that was one of the things that helped him with this issue of, well, how do I communicate uh, to ministers and to others what we do? So I'm a great enthusiast for saying, people ought to have a safe space in which they can um, exercise skills in the policy making area. Yeah. I, I would very mm. much advocate mm. that. Um, you need to kind of control and manage how you do it so that it works and it's mm. a success um, rather than a failure. But I, I, think it, I think it's a very positive element. So, you know, I would never argue that somebody who is a deep specialist in mm. one area 
is is less qualified than you know somebody who's 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 not a specialist in in any particular area. Um, uh, one one thing that I do always pick mm. people up is I always pick people up on the notion of talking about people as generalists. Miles knows this because <coughs> he's had me pick him up on this. Actually, I think you need to be very clear about what other specialism it is you're going to exercise, and I think policy making is actually a specialism mm. in its own right, not just none That's of the above. Mm. But anyway, I think another point about this is actually. Uh, and it goes back actually to Bob's point about the level of the mm -hmm. chief scientist within the department as well. It's actually within, say, DEFRA or the Department of Health or the MOD or, or a department which has science embedded at its core in many ways. There are many decisions in those departments that you couldn't possibly take mm -hmm. without significant no. scientific Absolutely. advice. Um, in a way, they're going to do science better always, mm -hmm. and I think they do do science better. It's, it's when you get to the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, when you get to the Home Office, mm -hmm. when you get to the Department for Education, that I think some of these <laughs> issues really start to fall down. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, when I was talking to, um, uh, doing interviews for my book, I spoke to Dave King, former mm -hmm. government chief scientist, who was talking to some mandarins at one point about, uh, challenged them, uh, can you uh, name an area of public policy to which science is irrelevant? And the guy from the <coughs> Department of Work and Pension said, my entire department. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, um, it's yeah. actually staggering. And, and I think that embedding science more deeply within those departments where it is not immediately mm. obviously yeah. relevant is in many ways the bigger challenge mm. than getting it done slightly better in DEFRA, which already does it yeah. okay, if or, you see what I mean. In, indeed, in terms of having a kind of flying squad, you know, who can be your sort of phone a friend at the moment where you need something like that. Perhaps, yeah. Um, you know, and, and across the piece in a lot of the professions as part mm. of civil service reform, we are looking at this concept of a shared, um, you know, a shared pool of expertise, mm. for example, on commercial skills, you know, and I wonder in some of these cases whether having something that you could draw on uh, for mm. science would, mm. would, would, would help. I certainly think that identifying those with science and engineering backgrounds, as I've said, is important. But I do want to say that this idea that by studying history you become a generalist and by studying science you become a specialist is fundamentally flawed. Mm. There is just as much science mm. around as there is history, actually, the science all the way through history. So I believe that, I mean, that, that as a concept needs to be attacked. And the other point about speaking up, um, what the um, scientists in Italy were being tried for was not for speaking up, it was actually for not speaking up because their scientific results were interpreted as saying that there would not be an earthquake rather than that the probability or whatever was low. I don't know, disagree with the trial, but it's not a, I don't think you can use that as a reason for not speaking out. Um, it's more a warning about the consequences of a not having a proper understanding of risk. And I think this came up mm. earlier and I would say that though the difference mm. between mass and weight is fundamental to us all here. Mm. Understanding mm. risk mm. and po probability. I think there's a French philosopher, I forget his name, who said better an impossible probability than an improbable possibility. Because, <laughs> if in, terms of, in terms of communicating, because the understanding of risk tends to be very uh, low in those, you know, it's a generalization who haven't got a mathematical or scientific background, and that has real consequences for the understanding of what the implications of certain policies are. So that's what I would, the key. So, Chi, I just wanted, before we go to a final round of questions, yeah. I just wanted to ask you about this point about uh, the adversariality. Is that a word? Oh, that's interesting. Being uh, I mean, yes, um, I mean, we, we discussed, I think, Katrina talked yeah. about the adversarial nature mm -hmm. of science. I mean, it, 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 putting a proposition <laughs> and having it knocked down and knocked down and knocked down till it's the, it's, it, is, it is proven as being the only explanation. That is, a ve that is adversarial by nature. So I, I mean, I, take, I think the, the, the wider point you make about is, mo is again about the lack of value for science because it's some, um, I mean, the debates of, that we have in politics should be about values, not about the underlying evidence. But because we may confuse or not understand the, the two, the underlying evidence becomes caught up in the values. 
and we should be, we as politicians, but also the public and, uh, and the media should be, should be able to distinguish between the two. So I don't think there's anything in the nature of British po adversarial politics which makes it less, um, less able to take in scientific advice. I think it's the standing of science in our culture and wider society. Okay, we're going to do one last round of questions. So one right, one right at the front, and then we'll go up this side. We'll try and take everybody who put their hands up last time, so no one extra. So we're going to take five questions, speed questions. Though. Okay, Mike, uh, Mike Hume, um, University of East Anglia. Just to pick up on this point about evidence and values, uh, which is a comment that Mark made earlier on in his talk about the clear separation between evidence and values. And I just want to challenge that a little bit, I think, because the point surely is that good decision making requires skillful use of both evidence and values. Mm. Mm. And mm. it's not a case of recognizing that one part of this divide, mm. and the danger is that the science becomes the evidence and the policy becomes the values. Mm. Actually, skillful reading of evidence mm. is able to see where values have actually shaded or influenced the evidence. And a skillful reading of values uh, it can help to understand ways in which different types of evidence shade or influence values. So I just don't think this divide, this neat divide between evidence and values of science and policy is the right way to be thinking of this. And skillful handling of both is actually what's necessary for good decision making. Okay, that's a very interesting point. Let's go there and then up. I'm Lucy from uh, Biomed Central and Open Access Publisher. Um, my sort of question or comment is there's been a lot of talk about um, sort of uh, putting science in a, in a box of not being applicable. And I wonder if that perhaps to a degree starts earlier. So I sort of graduated a couple of years ago from a biology degree and there was a lot of talk about what your potential career options are and they were invariably specifically very sort of pure or applied science. There was no talk about going on to graduate schemes and things. We're told that we have very transferable skills, but we're not told how those could be used in wider society and, and aren't actively encouraged to participate in wider society sort of in terms of careers. You're told to be a scientist. And I wonder if that could be a more significant part of the problem than we've heard so far, that it might not be... I, I mean, it obviously is a case of assuming that you need to be an economist to understand the money and all the rest of it, but perhaps even this idea of scientists need to be scientists as opposed to people with a science background need to be part of the bigger picture. Okay, certainly in DEFRA, a lot of the main policy mm. people have PhDs in yeah. scientific subjects. I mean, it's very different to the Treasury. I mean, it's some even in the Treasury. <laughs> <laughs> I, used to, I used to have a PhD in physics. He's now a director of finance and So actually, it is quite interesting how many people with those backgrounds actually go into the yeah. you know, main policy stream of civil <laughs> service as well. Mm. So, it's not, so there are other options. Fast stream competition closes in a week's time. So, <laughs> yes, behind you. Do you pass the mic back? Hi, I'm Caroline Fines. I work in philanthropy. I'm trying to get philanthropy to be more based on evidence, so bringing the scientific way of thinking, to your point, into a different area. I wanted to come back to something that Mark said right at the beginning about randomised control trials. And you said, why is it that we don't have more randomised control trials? And I wanted to put that back to the panel, reframe it perhaps, not let's all have a moan about why not, but what needs to happen in order for us to do this? Like this. That method has been around for ages, and the phonics example in particular has been around for ages. Like why do we still have this? You know, even you know, even you know, bits of HMRC are doing randomised trials now. Why are there not more of them? Okay, and we'll just go. We're going to go very quickly down this side. I think there are slightly more people than I thought would have. But Hi, I'm Beck Smith from the Campaign for Science and Engineering. And um, recently, we highlighted that many government departments are making disproportionate cuts to their R&D budget in comparison to overall budget cuts. How do you think this is going to affect departments' ability to produce evidence-based policy? Okay, yep. Yes, sir. Yes, because I missed you out last time around. <laughs> yep. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm from uh, Teach First and a recent science graduate. I'm now a science teacher in West London. Um, I was just wondering if you think that the Department for Education has more of a responsibility to engage young people in science, and perhaps as a knock-on effect of that, uh, of that would that mean that they could then be tracked in the civil service? And is this a relevant thing could be with the sort of not being enough scientists in the civil service? Yes, and just... 
Hello, my name is Michael West. I'm a civil servant at the Department of Health. Um, it occurs to me that over the course of the evening, um, we've heard a fair bit about science, but we've heard a lot about scientists. Mm. And I wondered if, the, if that was um, simply a form of shorthand or if the panel thinks that there is, uh, is, it's rather more important to differentiate between those two things. That sounds very deep final comment. So I'm going to ask the panel to offer some closing reflections and pick up on, on some of those themes. I mean, I think particularly if you can think about some of the things, I mean, the thing Simon, although he's walked out, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm making him feel really bad about this, um, particularly his point about that I think came here about how actually do we, how do we create space where we can maybe better rebalance the sort of different competing sorts of inputs into the into the policy decision. I mean, maybe uh, Mike Hume's way is a different way of thinking about that, but uh, is there more space for you know, more rigorous evidence, uh, creating a bit of space for that, to, whichever it sources, to, uh, to merge with some of the things of you know, weighing that versus some of the public input, but also this thing, what's the threat from cuts in R&D budgets, Caroline's point there. And I think if anyone wants to comment about, you know, are scientists too confined to the box? It always struck me when I left university how few of the scientists went on, they all went into banking, because that seemed to be <laughs> where the money was. So, you know, Citibank loomed and stuff like that. So, you know, are scientists too, too boxed or whatever? And is that actually, do we just not have enough scientists to be infusing all bits of our culture? Uh, what well, a, a difficult um, mixture of questions there, but <laughs> just one about reduced budgets. I mean, we live in hard times. We've, we've, we've got to live with um, r reduced budgets, and there's a competition for all sorts of um, competing claims on health and, and military and education and, and so on. So um, I think uh, it, it would be unduly precious to say that the science budget has got to be absolutely preserved come what may. What we've got to do is to be clever about how we use it and spend it and uh, make sure we get um, proportionately uh, more results from, from, from fewer resources. We've got to do that. I just want to, to end up in, in this um, business of collectivism. The motto of the Royal Society, the Latin motto, is nullus in verba, which very loosely translated means take nobody's word for it. In other words, be sceptical. And part of the scientific process is actually being sceptical, asking questions. And so I come back to the idea that you, you need a team view. I, I'm convinced in my own department I need a, a scientific advisory committee as well as my own judgment and my colleagues' judgment about scientific matters um, because we need a consensus view that is uh, generated by uh, a wider debate than just having if you like, one person saying this is the, the way mm. forward. Science isn't quite like that, mm. and engineering certainly isn't, as I've indicated. Mm. Katrina? Well, on the point about budgets, I think I, I very much agree with, with Rod. You know, actually, the world we live in, realistically, um, times are tough. And, um, you know, I don't think anybody would say you can give an absolute guarantee <coughs> to something because it's science. What I think that means is that we all need to get better at evaluating um, you know, science and making sure that we are making the case for the good things that it can give us. Um, and equally, um, I'm back to the point I made earlier about working with others and actually joining up the different bits mm. of science from whatever source so that we are multiplying the effect that you get from the money that's um, money that's going in. Um, on the on the question about um, how do you make space to weigh up the different bits of um, evidence, I think it does require a concerted effort. There are some um, bits of um, government government agencies who are very good at that thing of spending time with consumers, so that you are actually getting an informed consumer view back. Food Standards Agency actually have done a lot of work in, in this particular area. Um, and I think there's a lot to be, to be said for that. On the subject of randomised controls, um, uh, I don't know why there aren't more of them, but don't the words sound scary? <laughs> you know, if you are the parent whose child is about to be part of one of these, you know, doesn't it sound a bit scary? So there's something about explaining the process, I think. 
uh, and mainstreaming it in a way that you know people would feel more comfortable with. So you're definitely doing any more randomised control trials? <laughs> Famous. I said I wouldn't ask for badges. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just ignore just, it. Well, I think I think I think we've done enough. You've done enough. <laughs> 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 Chief. Um, well, there's, there's two points I really want. I think uh, there's a wide range of questions, too much to try and go through. There's two points I really want to pick up on. But I will just say on the departmental science budget spend, the issue is not only that it has been cut when the government promised to maintain science spending, but that the departmental spend, you do not forecast what you will spend. You only say what you have spent. So we can only see that it has been cut. We cannot see, so it's exciting, we cannot see that it will be cut. And you choose the way and sometimes you allocate what goes into the science spend. So, so what I would like to see is a forecast of what departmental science spend there will be. But that wasn't the main issue I wanted to pick up on. I thought the question about um, evidence versus values and whether there should be a distinction was very interesting. We're talking about science-based evidence. There is such a thing as values evidence, but we're talking about science-based evidence. And I absolutely think there's a distinction between science and values. But I do think you're absolutely right that you need to be able to integrate both of them because the decision, the policy decision, um, I think there's a misconception that the policy decision will always be taken based on science-based evidence. It may not. It may be taken based on values. You know, we, you know, for exa one example I'd give, we stop, if we ban smoking, we would save thousands of lives. I think there's lots of evidence about that, but the values of the country are such that we will not ban smoking. So I think that's really, I think, that, I think that's an imp it's important to recognize values and evidence and use them both appropriately. I just wanted to end on the point about um, scientists and engineers and going into um, other careers or politics. I mean, um, it, so given my own particular example, I was thinking it's quite interesting. A lot of people, in the, especially during the campaign, came up to me. You know, at the, at the time, politicians' reputations. This was 2010. Was somewhere beneath the <laughs> floor, and engineers and scientists, as part of manufacturing future, their reputations were rising for the first time in a long time. So a lot of people asked me, what on earth are you doing going from engineering to politics? And what I, you know, what I said, yeah, en I went into engineering because I wanted to make things work. Politics is also about mm. trying to make things work. For me, it is a absolutely a natural progression, and I use a lot of my engineering training and, and background as a politician, and particularly given my brief. Um, what I would say, though, is I think the, f the fault, if you can say that, with engineers and scientists do share is the view that their work should speak for itself. Yeah. You know, you end up what you do, do lots and lots of stuff. You end up, you know, with an equation, it equals x, and that quad eret demonstratum, you know, that is it. And politics is a big shift from that because the answer does not speak for itself. The work does not speak for itself. It does need to be explained, sold, etc. So that is a shift. But I do really, really strongly feel it is one more engineers and more scientists should take. Mark. So a, th a very interesting question about the where do values stop and evidence begin. And of course, you're absolutely right. There are many situations in which one's values will influence the relative weight that you will place on evidence at all or different types of evidence. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. I guess what I'm trying to get at mostly here, and, 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 th and most decisions will involve uh, balancing an element of that. I guess what I'm trying to, to get at, which I think happens far too much though, are actually when, it, when decisions are presented as being evidence-based, when they're really actually almost wholly based on values. And to give you a current example, uh, Jeremy Hunt claiming that he's not following his values, but the evidence in supporting a 12-week limit for abortion is, to me, transparently rather odd. And I think he... I'm not saying that his position is wrong. Uh, I think he's entirely entitled to it. But um, to claim that that's an evidence-based decision strikes me as rather strange. Um, and, and that's, I guess, what I'm saying about this. I think there needs to be honesty about decisions that are really almost all values-based. Um, which are often 
there's often the evidence sort of sprinkled over the top of it as if it's a kind of magic dust yeah. that makes it okay. Uh, I, th uh, I think politici it's fine for politicians to have values and to base their decisions on it, but, but, but they ought to be more honest about it. Um, randomised controlled trials, why, what do we need to do to, to, to make them happen more? Well, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge that they are a possibility. And I think, in, again, in too many departments that don't have science embedded at their core, they're not even thought of as an option. And I think that's the, the first mm -hmm. thing. That's why it's actually more important for there to be a strong chief scientist in education or the Home Office or the Department for Justice than it is in DEFRA or the Department of Health in many ways. In those departments, the science will get done. Uh, it's in the ones where it might not get done that it's especially important. <coughs> and finally, I'm going to finish on your point about careers as well. Uh, just uh, as, as much with an observation as anything. So I, I'm a humanities graduate. When I was at university, all the peop other people besides myself who were in student uh, politics and student media were also humanities students. Now, this is where my non-evidence-based view comes in. <laughs> but uh, my hypothesis is one of the main reasons for that is that we, the humanities students, had time. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and actually, I think it's rather important because those habits that get formed at an early age, are you a political animal? Are you somebody who gets involved in this kind of thing? are very important to your subsequent behaviour. Um, and I think we need to find ways to make scientists, engineers, those involved in more technical training, to give them the opportunity to have time, whether that's as time out, um, so, uh, as sort of opportunities for internships during PhD programmes. I mean, there, there must be a lot of creative ways we can think of to enable uh, young people who are starting out on potential scientific careers to see policy and politics as sort of part of where they might take those careers. Okay, well, that's a great point to end and to make up for all that lost time while you were at university uh, or working away in the lab while the rest of us were having fun and being involved <laughs> in politics, there are, we are delighted to be able to invite you to drinks outside <laughs> immediately afterwards, courtesy of our very excellent partners part of this. As we said, this is the first in a series looking at the way in which politics, policy, science interact and with the aim of producing something which can offer some thoughts, I think, no more than that, to the incoming Chief Scientific Advisor next April. So before you go and rush for the exit, uh, could you all just very quickly thank our excellent panel for their performance tonight? <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. This was a bit of a different uh, subject for the Institute of Government. We haven't done anything on this before. So if you have suggestions for future events that we might do on this sort of theme, uh, get in touch with me, uh, jill.rutter at instituteforgovernment.org.uk or just outside over a drink. So it would be very interesting to hear from you. So thank you all very much for coming.